What does that what does that teach you about the heart of God or the heart of compassion when you're in moments like that? Um, of how much he bleeds for us. Mm-hmm. How much he bleeds for us of because I can only care in a limited capacity. The human art is only so wide. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it stretches because as as much as we know the Lord, but he's he's the litmus test. He is the limit. Mm-hmm. And to see, well, lack thereof. He's you the lack the of the limit. Yeah, yeah he yeah, sets yeah. the bar of that, yeah. yeah. Of like, if I'm only able to a- like apprehend and comprehend the situation in my own limited capacity of what I am seeing, mm-hmm. like how much more mm-hmm. of the cross of Christ is mm-hmm. is linked to this, and how His heart bleeds for us. Welcome to a bonus episode of Beyond Damascus, where encounter meets mission. My name is Dan Dimite, and I am joined here in the studio with a illustrious group of people. Oh, wow. I have switch it up. Aaron Richards. Oh, hello, sir. Come and on. Brad Pierron. Yes, sir. And, uh, drum roll, please. Special guest, Mr. Wait, no, Father Daniel Shorts. Hey. <laughs> Let's start it awkward. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's kind of how we do it. That's yeah. how we do it. If it's not an awkward. Also, I do want to give a warning to anyone who is watching on YouTube today. <laughs> there is a fly in the studio today. And typically when a fly yeah. is flying around, it's Aaron cannot help but jump mm-hmm. out of his seat and try to murder true. said fly. So I <laughs> hope this innocent fly stays far away from us. But who knows what's going to happen? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have not met Father Dan Schwartz, we are so excited to have him with us today. Um, wow, Father, you date all the way back to the early Catholic Youth Summer Camp days in 2005 when you were a wee little high school lad as a counselor for our middle school camp. That's pretty right. amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think I started as, uh, I guess we would call it acting staff mm-hmm. at that point as yeah. well, because it would be weird for me to counsel <laughs> me at the same age group. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we started Catholic Youth Summer Camp in 2001 um, with like 63 or so campers. Yeah. And now this summer, we just launched a 2023 summer of Catholic Youth Summer Camp and we'll have well over six, I mean, 7,000 campers. So we're pretty excited to see what God mm-hmm. has been doing. Um, this interview and testimony is going to be so remarkable because uh, Father, you've spent the last uh, few years as a military chaplain, and, yeah, correct. and God has led you through some pretty insane, intense experiences. You were in Afghanistan when the U.S. troops were pulling out, and you experienced the loss of a number of your uh, Marines under your leadership and your spiritual care. And so we want to hear that story, and we want to kind of understand how does uh, the the Christian and how does a spiritual leader walk with his people through such a difficult time? And then how do you maintain your own strength through that time? Why don't you share right now kind of where you are, what, where you're stationed right now, what it looks like in your life as a military chaplain? Every detail. <laughs> Every detail. Uh, so right now I'm on the island of Guam, so I'm Woo. still technically within the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Those farthest, U.S. territories, I'll tell you what. The farthest point away from the United States. So right now it is tomorrow in Guam. Uh, so whenever you fly back, you experience the same day twice. <laughs> uh, so it's great. So it's Groundhog's left, Day. I left on a Wednesday and I arrived on a Wednesday. Um, and I am a uh, installation chaplain, which means non-deployable unit. So I just look after the base. Uh, now that's a loose term, just look after the base. So I have a chapel, uh, recently just got hit with a category four typhoon. So we can't really use it. Uh, it got flooded, but that's, it's, that's just typhoon area. Uh, so we do have a Catholic community there of families, uh, of the Marines, sailors, coast guard who are on base DOD employees. And so we do have something of a parish, uh, that is Hmm. there. But then there's also a number of other military units that don't have chaplain coverage. Say, for example, um, right now we're looking for to start a new chaplain with the Coast Guard. But in the meantime, I look after those particular ships and commands. Uh, We have helos up in the north. There's an Air Force base there. We have uh, engineering areas that can rebuild missiles and torpedoes. And so all these different bells and whistles that are on Guam. There's a lot of huge military presence on Guam. Not all of those have an embedded chapel. So we look after those as well. And then the third part, uh, so you have kind of like the traditional military parish model 
Uh, you have you're looking after all those different units. And the third part is it's a port. It's it's a it's a it's a major military port. You have ships that come in and they'll do something called an RFF, request for forces. And so that's like, hey, do you have a Catholic priest? And I'll go on board their ships, whether it's an aircraft carrier, destroyer, cruiser, whatever it might be. And I'll say mass and I'll do sacraments for them, look after in any way that they might need. Wow, that's uh, wild. So it, it's, mm-hmm. it's a weird kind of ebb and flow of activity. So when my, my misconception of the military chaplaincy was I assumed the military chaplain stayed on the different bases. And, and it sounds like right now in Guam, you are stationed in, at a base in Guam, but you also did deployments. And I didn't realize chaplains did deployments with troops. And so you, you deployed to Afghanistan. Did you deploy other areas as well? I did. Uh, and it, there's different models between the branches. So as a Navy chaplain, we can serve all the maritime branches, Coast Guard, Marines, Navy, which is why my last duty station, I was with Marines. And they're like, how can you do that? Like, were you in the Marine Corps? I'm like, well, yeah, I was. And people are like, well, are you a Marine? I'm like, no, I'm not. And then you, see, you, see, you see their brain kind of breaking. I'm like, you can have Navy personnel in the Marine Corps. Say, for example, Marines don't have medics. They're Navy corpsmen uh, that go with them. Uh, so I was deployed. Um, we were out of Camp Pendleton, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines. And we deployed to the CENTCOM. It's what's called an SP MAGTAF. Uh, this is out of Benghazi, the the DOD, Department of Defense, wanted a force that could respond within six hours to anywhere in the Middle East. So we had that mission. And so we were co-located into a number of different countries, uh, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, a little bit of Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. And I was like in Bahrain for like six hours, but that doesn't count. <laughs> like, we literally like top down. I'm like, oh, cool. All right. And then we just left. Okay. <laughs> And so while you were in Afghanistan, you, you underwent probably the, one of the hardest things you could ever imagine as a military chaplain. Um, but I, before we dive into that testimony, I just want to, uh, our listeners to kind of understand who you are as a person. Like Aaron and I have had the joy to, to know you for a long time. Brad's known you for a yeah. long time. So <laughs> kind of getting the band back together. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. <laughs> so why don't we just go like get, get a context of, who were you in, like growing up and how did you come into relationship with Jesus Christ and even mm-hmm. kind of discover that first love for him and for the church, for the Eucharist and mm-hmm. decide to give your life as a priest? I think kind and of- And you have two seconds, to, uh, two minutes to share that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and go. Um, I really think that one of the best words to use for it is project that I really was seeking because I was looking at the Marine Corps uh, in fact, I think you wrote a recommendation for me yeah. to, go, to, to, to go to officer training uh, when I was in college. Um, that was awkward. That didn't, <laughs> that didn't go through. Um, oh, was, you didn't read my recommendation. <laughs> Either did they. I told, like, I told them all the stories. It's, uh, it, I was looking very much like, looking back on myself as a young man, I was looking for a project. There, there's always something I want to have my hands to something to build up, something to strive for, something to wake up for in the morning. Um, And that project doesn't, it's not like you're trying to build a structure, but a project of people and a project of ideas. And I think that was something I was very much craving, both in my personality, but as we say, grace builds on nature. And so the Lord had created that within me with intentionality, but wanted to use it and build it and uh, place it within within his context of salvation. And I initially thought that was within the Marine Corps. So I was, I was very much chasing a career in the Marine Corps. And when it became clear that that was not the Lord's will, I was a little confused about, mm-hmm. okay, what do, I, what do I do with that? And camp, I think, set a really good seed of, there's also this beautiful project of ministry, of building people. And the greatest thing about that project as well is you see people gain and take on their own project from the Lord. And that was so very fulfilling. And the world got distracting, as it does through high school and college. And I suppose, not that I had ever forgotten it, but uh, the attention gets scattered here, there, and everywhere. And mine kind of settled on the Marine Corps, but it, it circled back, as it kind of is now, that whenever we're going through a point of transition, I call them thresholding moments. Mm. The Lord likes to pull from our past of like, hey, return to a foundation Mm-hmm. of where you know where I am and where I've been acting. So he's, he's a God of the present, but for him, the past is also the present. Ooh, we're getting too deep in theological <laughs> in the personal story. But the idea that the past is living and efficacious. Mm. And so 
<clears throat> it's weird to be thinking of these adult career decisions then be like, hey, remember summer camp, but it's no, it was remember the Lord. And he started to direct that more and more like, hey, the idea of a project of sacrifice and a brotherhood and of began directing that more and more of the idea of military service towards the priesthood. Yep. And then the joke is, then he gave back military service. I'm like, you could have just told me. I got so mad. <laughs> I was like, you just told I me had from to the go beginning. Seven years of seminary just yeah. to get to the Marine Corps. I thought, like, here I am, like bleeding out my heart. I'm like, Lord, I'll give you my career in the Marine Corps. I'm like, yeah. I'm so like, it's yours, Lord. And then he's like, you want to go back? I'm like, well, come on. <laughs> I thought we had a good thing going in the first place. Yeah, it's just if you if you don't think God has a sense of humor, I don't think you know him well enough. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just one big practical joke. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> what was your initial encounter with the Lord like? Do you, uh, was there a time or an experience where you're like, wow, this is when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ? A couple of times. I think adoration at camp was very important. Uh, being able to be still was a big lesson. That's still learning that. Um, not that there's ever like high impact, high agitation moments in the military that will take your peace. Uh, so that's it's a very never important that. life. No, it never occurs. <laughs> a very silent organization. Um, that stillness before the Lord, uh, learning that type of communication, beginning to learn that type of communication, uh, stepping within the mind and heart of the church. So St. Monologues were, were big. That was, that was a big thing for me. Okay. For our listeners who have no idea what that is, <laughs> oh, what, yeah. what is a, what is a St. Monologue? Oh, uh, so the camp at, uh, through its programming through the week, at one point the campers will encounter their uh, staff members who are acting out uh, these monologues, these speeches from the saints in different periods of time, uh, depending on a particular theme, whatever theme um, is that year. Uh, this year we have uh, Ex Morte in Vitam, uh, for, from Death into Life. And I think the saints we had this year, let's see, we had the two men on the road to Damascus, the angels at the tomb, our Lady of Chestahova, that was new. I really liked that one. That's, that was really good. St. Thomas, which was good to see. I had done St. Thomas, and he took a very different turn with it. But I'm like, I think, I think he did it better. Like, that was really Because, you know, different people come up with different, they, they pray through the saints, and they, they come up with the, uh, different little factoids and uh, different mm -hmm. little aspects of their character. So it's refreshing to see. But, yeah, that's... That's what the monologues are. Yeah, it's yeah. really neat too because um, the <laughs> everyone always loved when Father Dan would you do would do the monologues because you just were able to do the Italian accent as well, which makes <laughs> well, which makes the monologue. I it. won't say who this is, but a particular person didn't know. It was funny because they went to the Dominican Order for a little bit, didn't know that Saint Thomas Aquinas was Italian, and I just told him to Google where Aquino was. <laughs> <laughs> it was really bad. Like, Here we are. <laughs> yeah, they didn't speak to me for a couple of days, but it was, it was fine. Um, no was accents funny. help because it's it gets it's a new way of hearing, and you want to you want to give the story as much for the saint, for the sake of the saint, you want to give it every, um, I guess you could say every art artistic handhold mm -hmm. you can for mm -hmm. someone to actually enter into mm -hmm. and see that person for who they are. I mean, that's the goal of the actor. Yeah. And when you're taking on a saint, like, okay, how do I not just reveal this person's personality, but how do I bring forth yeah. someone's heart? It's interesting that that's so, such an important part of your story. I, I think um, there, there is something about Catholicism that I've always appreciated about that that we have these stories that we're not only meant to like read and revere, but see how we can implement them into our lives. Oh, yeah. and, and you were mentioning earlier, like trying to find a project to get your hands on, like mm -hmm. the project of sainthood, like to get our hands on that and to see what God has for us. And that's big. Mm, but I think yeah. you had something here. Well, well, one of the themes that we draw back to frequently here at Damascus is it came out of a study from Dynamic Catholic back in I think 2004 or something like that. It was a long okay. time. And uh, it, it identified that most young people who maintain their faith throughout life, uh, post-confirmation, do so because they've experienced the Lord powerfully through some type of event or experience that's pulled them out of their norm. Yeah. And what strikes me about you, so I've, I've known Father Dan since you were probably fifth or sixth grade. I don't know. It's been a long time. It has been. That's and a while. For, for listeners, Aaron, Aaron and Dan were my uh, youth ministers <laughs> yeah, back at St. Agatha. So they seen the good, the bad, the ugly. It's part of the reason uh, we uh, lost our job at that church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, Father, it's part of the reason we've all turned out like this. <laughs> of course, that's a joke. Of course. <laughs> I know that you, you come from a very strong Catholic family and, and have a history of, of Catholic school. Um, and those things really lay the foundation work that allows mm. you to like 
when when you finally when you finally look back to 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 cultivate that seed, you realize that the ground has been prepared. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. But uh, you you mentioned this like project mentality, and when I think of of you throughout the course of our career in youth ministry, and then of course here at Catholic Youth Summer Camp, uh, you you always rose to the occasion whenever we had something that was outside of the norm. Mm-hmm. So. Like mm-hmm. I think of I think of you as the guy who was who was always so excited about our camping trips or our retreats or our trips to uh, service projects. Like always seeking to be engaged in the front line. And um, uh, you know, as as individuals are listening, uh, if if there's a member of a family or something who who you feel like uh, needs that little push to to get engaged, mm-hmm. I think I think your witness to me has always been like mm. uh, seek opportunity that's outside of the norm. You mm-hmm. know. There's something about the Lord that's met at the frontier and part of it, I think has been personality, but then then there's also points in which Mm -hmm. I don't know why he just keeps putting me in those situations. Like the, the typhoon we just went through Mm -hmm. in Guam, or I was embedded with a coast guard cutter and we're encountering these islands that maybe only have three, uh, three to six people that live on them. And they hadn't seen a priest in decades. And so I'm like, we were talking about this story before. I'm swimming a mass <laughs> kit to shore. I'm like, hey, by the way, I'm a pre. I felt like a 15th century Jesuit <laughs> or something. I'm like, I, I come yeah. and all I bring is Christ. <laughs> like, it was a, something epic. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. Did they make waterproof cassocks? I'm not sure. You but, definitely yeah. didn't bring wise words. Just you brought in Jesus Christ and <laughs> no. him crucified, right? No, no, no it was an kidding. amazing experience. No, I bet. I bet. Well, there is something too that um, we talk about on this show quite a bit that... Um, there's something about mission that takes us there too, yeah. right? That, that we all have this call in our lives that take us outside of ourselves and bring us to that frontier. I gave a, a men's talk at our last Empower Conference here, which we have for young adults mm-hmm. every December. And um, kind of the principle of my talk is that as men and, and women too, but we were made to be on the edge because that's where we encounter the Lord. We encounter eternity, infinity. Like some, there's something about standing on the seashore when you look out to the ocean and can't see the other side. There's something immeasurable about it. And when we live our life in a way that- Oh, very aware of that on Guam. I was about to say, I was wondering, like the way I was tying that in is like when you, um, when you go to an island like that, like, um, do, I don't know, does, does the like immensity of, of the call to priesthood strike you in a different way? When you're like, these people probably haven't seen a priest in decades. And there's something immense about the call God has for us because of the immensity of himself. There were a couple of things from that experience. One is the power of the priesthood mm-hmm. uh, to no merit of myself. Like mm-hmm. they, they knew English. Uh, it was clear that they learned it uh, back, back in school at some point yeah. so they're, because they're, they, could, they could sail back to Saipan and be able to learn. Um, but just because I am priest, I'm now welcomed into one of some of the most intimate centers of their life. Hmm. Now I'm, I'm welcomed into their homes. I'm like, that's, that's not just their home. Like that's their, yeah. that's their safety on that. Like that, that's it on that Island. Um, and their food, which they procure all by themselves, uh, there. So that like, that's a value to them. Like, do you want any water? I'm like, how are you guys collecting water? Like this yeah. is one of your highest commodities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. but it's, I think when we encounter the Lord, he also then to take on himself, since he has a heart for encounter, he asks us to encounter others in the identity that he gives us. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, I think that was probably the key takeaway from that. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Oh, that's so exciting. It's such yeah. a cool life. That's such a cool <clears throat> life. You know, we talk about our missionary program on this show a lot too. And um, I think one of the hallmarks of our missionary program, Aaron and Dan, you might be able to add to that is that you call people into a life of service that's very different than anything else they'll do in their yeah. lives. And I see the same thing in the, the military chaplaincy ever since you um, came out of seminary and first kind of shared with me that that would be where you'd be going in a couple of years. Like, Hey, I'm here now. I think it was St. Matthew. And, yep. and yeah, that was but, my um, first assignment. Yeah. And, and you were like, but I'm going to be going <laughs> out on this like great adventure. I, I think um, there's something to that, that I've held when I call like uh, men and women into our missionary program, Mm -hmm. like, Hey, like there's actually something amazing for you. That's going to be outside of anything you've known before, but Mm. it's super exciting. Our motto here is uh, live the adventure. And I think sometimes like the, yeah, I mean the, the adventures that we're called to when we answer God's call are just remarkable. Remarkable. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, you brought up an interesting point that like, the high school or college father, Dan, Daniel Schwartz was like, he, he, you were always drawn to the, 
the more adventurous um, aspects of ministry. And sometimes, um, you know, I talk to so many parents who, well, my, my kid isn't super excited about going to weekly youth group or isn't excited about ses- th- this experience or that experience or gets all at like, like, um, like fidgety during family prayer. And I, I think sometimes we have to appeal to the different, even personality types and, and the yep. things that will b- draw you alive. Like you have the, the water bottle over there, uh, father, the core expeditions are, are good friends, uh, the Zimmers and all of them that run core expeditions. It's a wild yep. experience of some people. I'm good friends with Dr. Zimmer. He's a, yeah. <laughs> he's a wild man. He's a wild him. man. And I think like, that's the, some people, their heart needs to discover the adventure of Christianity through more external means as opposed to the internal life. I, I was thinking the same thing, Dan, about high school students, but I mean, gosh, if, if you're listening to the show and you're, you're like, okay, I, I want to maintain this commitment to the faith, but like my heart feels bored from time to time. I know I've been there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, jump out of the norm. Like yeah. there's ways to experience the, the life of faith that are, that are different from your daily routine. Yep. And isn't that true with everything that's monotonous too, though? Cause like even think like, um, a lot of times, uh, when I'm meeting with my like small group of guys, they'll be like, yeah, like married life or family life's getting monotonous. It's like, well, take a date night or take, take your kids out to go do something that you haven't sure. done in a while. Yep. There's something about get, um, getting outside. Aaron, you, you talk about this sometimes that when you're in a, like a season of prayer where you feel like you're settling into a groove, yeah, switch you, it up, you switch it up because then the Lord is able to do something new. There, there's something kind of in life generally uh, about that, um, that adventure, I guess. Yeah. I think for the most part, uh, and I don't want to speak for women cause I'm not a woman, but I, I think a lot of times <laughs> men, they, it's probably a good thing. <laughs> they, they, their interior life is developed and, um, from their exterior life. So you encounter hmm. something or you experience something on the exterior, which then propels the interior to, mm-hmm. to contemplate. Hmm. Whereas women, maybe the converse where the interior life is the starting place that informs and, and, and drives the, externally. the yeah. external. And, um, and so w- most of the time our faith formation for young people and it, is very, in, it, the starting point is the interior life as opposed mm. to the exterior life. And there's something mm. about going out on mission, going yeah. out on service, going out on a project that allows the interior life. Like, well, I encountered this, I experienced this. I, 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 I came against this. Now mm-hmm. I can contemplate yeah. and, and encounter God in that. Yeah. What wonder, um, father, when you think about like the, uh, the adventures of your life, I, I think we were talking before the podcast started about all the different hobbies and things you have. What are other things oh that my. you do as oh, a military yeah. chaplain outside of just, you know, swimming to remote islands and presenting <laughs> Jesus to people for the first time in decades? So that was, that was a Coast Guard thing, which was oh, great. Like, yeah. so, yeah. that was like a, Excuse me. You yeah. didn't swim from Guam to the island, but it was still, <laughs> still an epic story. <laughs> I was doing 16 knots. <laughs> breaststroke. <laughs> <laughs> He's also the next Michael Phelps, but we, yeah. we can oh say that gosh. for a different episode. Uh, no, it's... Uh, being on Guam, like I've always, I've always liked the outdoors. So one of my big things right now is uh, free diving, and I just got scuba certified recently over the last year. So oh that's boy, a, it's a we've whole been, we've been planning a trip. Aaron's <laughs> eyes lit up when I mentioned scuba, and uh, it's it's a whole different world under there. It's amazing. I bet. Um, it, it's bad that some of the turtles have become acquainted with me. Like they're not scared anymore. Like, like, that's like, it's like oh, no, it, it's the priest. He's harmless. Yeah, like, yeah. Just, <laughs> I'm, I'm picturing you like how they, uh, how they have the statues of St. Francis with the birds and stuff. It's going to be you diving with goggles and you're going to have a turtle. That's going to be your saint. Can statue. I have like a black tip shark? I mean, they're harmless. Oh, yeah, they're harmless. Okay. <laughs> if, uh, if we put a shark in. Yeah. Uh, so I do enjoy that. In the, and there's a lot of hiking in Guam. Um, it's that, that place still has like a lot of the, the land still has the memories on it from the Japanese occupation. Like you mm-hmm. can see the caves and the gun emplacements and those are cool to explore and mm-hmm. find. Uh, so the hiking, the free diving, um, found soccer. Like I'll play, I'll play with that. Come on. It's so funny. Some of them like discovered that I was a chaplain cause I just, you just don't lead with that. And it's not like I was hiding who I was. They're like, wait, are you the chaps? I'm like, um, the I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, do you mean like Christ or yeah. the Pope? Or like, I'm like, no, uh, <laughs> I'm not the form of all chaplains. Like, uh, and so it's, it's, it's cool to also see them become comfortable with mm-hmm. like, yeah, our chaps mm-hmm. play soccer with us. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's, it's not horribly graceful that that's poor, but you know, people come cause you just want to find community. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and then there's also been, uh, some, some of the younger couples we've, we've, we found a community together because uh, cool. the military there being, 
so far away from family, a completely different time zone uh, day. Actually, you're over the dateline mm-hmm. uh, and that, that can weigh on people. So when I call my family, you know, people are ending their day and I'm just starting mine. So mm-hmm. there's different energies there. And, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so people are very intentional about forming communities. So that's been, that's been good to have. Yeah. Um, other hobbies. Uh, let's, let's think. So there's soccer, free diving. There's that. Uh, do you play an indie game every now and again? Come on. I'm a big, I'm a big steam guy. Great adventure uh, out that way. It's uh, so I, I like to see, because it's a type of expression, like, no okay, doubt. this person's trying to create a particular experience and it's, so it's a kind of project mentality. Yeah. So I like to see what other people's <laughs> projects are. Same with yeah. music. Uh, so music and games, uh, just to, n- mm. not, not the, like I'm playing something all the way through. I just don't have the time for that anymore. Yeah, unfortunately. Sure. Sure. Well, one of uh, the most fascinating things when you were in college, uh, father was that you were you used, um, was it Taekwondo or the martial arts, uh, some form of martial arts to evangelize yeah, we your doing, friends? we were doing jujitsu, yeah. <laughs> it's basically Jesus and jujitsu. Yeah. <laughs> and how does Which was unusually Jesus successful. <laughs> yeah, it was unusually successful. Like, it shouldn't have been. Like, the Lord had to be behind that because that was a ridiculous idea. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> Jesus yeah, and jujitsu. People are giving their lives over to Christ. Yeah, yeah just so, so we can just, like, sneak around the shadows and take people down. I'm like, <laughs> well, there is that one guy who, um, is it Jason Wilson, I think he's, he's doing something like that now. So maybe you started a trend, but he's, <laughs> he's taking, um, actually this story is really cool. So if anyone's listening, I think it's Jason Wilson, if you want to look it up, but, um, he started a, I'm ju- listening like, so closely. <laughs> he started, he started a jujitsu gym in inner city Detroit. And it's a predominantly for, um, young men who have a proclivity towards, um, violence or towards affiliation with something that's not, um, of the Lord and he'll bring them in and it's crazy. He'll tie in the fathers. Mm. So he'll require the fathers to be there at certain times, not, not always, but at certain times. And the way that he plays out the dynamic between father and son and he, and he preaches the gospel throughout almost the entirety of it. You should look into it. I think that's really fascinated cool. by it. but yeah, I, I started into, yeah, I started, um, it's called the cave of, um, Oh, I'm I'm gonna blank on it, but it sounds epic. It's um, the cave of yeah. Well, it, it, it's it's the cave of <laughs> anything that it's, starts it's, like that. It's it was like something. Yeah. It was something <laughs> just about the way it began. My well, my own like Old Testament ignorance is is showing, but it was somewhere where like David was found. It was the cave of um. Uh, you have to look it up. There's a reason. <laughs> There's a biblical reference like, for why he calls it. The one it. where he snuck up on Saul, like that cave where before he was hiding. Great question. Or? I'm actually ignorant I'll of it. I'll have to ask it, this jujitsu jitsu Jesus. Look it up. No, yeah. Seriously, but long story short, like I, I started like looking into some of his videos and like it's really powerful what he does mm. for young men. That's awesome. That's awesome. So anyway, you might have been a trendsetter back in the day. I'm pretty sure he wasn't exposed to the But I'm glad the Lord kept the idea, but then purified it. Yes, hey, the voice yes. from our producer yes, over yes, here. Yes, yes, yes. Nice. <laughs> Saint uh, Google comes through. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Father, why don't we? Can we share uh, just with our audience a little bit about your experience being deployed in Afghanistan with the the Marines as they were um, in battle, but then also trying to flee, and then the the loss of those Marines? Would can you share with us just kind of what that experience was like and how you um, brought Christ and experienced Christ in that? Yeah, so I think a little bit of context to the situation is uh, we were activated for what's called a NEO, a non-combatant evacuation operation. Um, and well, as you might remember in the news, when you saw people kind of clinging to planes and that sort of thing, trying to get out of Afghanistan, uh, this is um, specifically within the city of Kabul. Uh, at the airport, the perimeter had been overrun. By then, we had one company on the ground. It was Echo Company. And when I saw that footage, because at that point I was in Kuwait, because before we, we were spending months already in uh, what we would call CENTCOM, which is the, the command area of the Middle East. And we had guys in Jordan, we had guys in Iraq, uh, we had guys in Saudi Arabia, and I would just bounce around from all these positions. So I was constantly rotating around the Middle East, uh, a lot of flight time. And when I saw that footage when I was in Kuwait, I knew we were going to get activated that they were going to send the whole battalion. And it wasn't clear, at least from what I understood of the situation, what the posturing of the Taliban was going to be, because this panic was all incited by how quickly the Taliban was retaking the country. Um, and so there's a big push from different uh, command personalities for trigger pullers, trigger pullers, trigger pullers. So like, hey, let's send only units that are able to do infantry work. 
And one of our commanding officers of the command element, because that's like our, for our particular construction, our battalion, that was, that was kind of like the, the brain, uh, said, you're going you're gonna to send a chaplain. You're going to send a chaplain with them. So even though I'm not a trigger puller, I don't bear a weapon, uh, this particular officer, which re- really struck to me when he saw the value of it, because he was just, you know, just a, a piss and vinegar Marine. <laughs> just like, I, got, I, I, I first really kind of sat down and spoke with him at the embassy in Baghdad. And I realized that when he speaks to somebody, he chain smokes. Yeah. And I was like, I was speaking to him for like 40 minutes. And I'm like, I really have to end this conversation or else I'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we had talked and I think he, one of the reasons uh, he made that decision is because through the whole conversation, you could, you could tell he was trying me out. Like, hey, what are you about? Mm-hmm. And uh, he had mm-hmm. seen a lot of chaplains and we all come from different backgrounds, different faith groups. And uh, he, he he, one, he wanted to know me as a person, but he was also like, hey, what are you about and are you good for my men? Because uh, he was totally about the individual Marine. Like, what is good for, what is good for the men? Um, and so we're activated for that. I was put on a C-17. We're all packed in there uh, together and we're heading off to, and it, and it goes uh, radio silent for a bit because you're going, you're going around Iran uh, to get to Afghanistan. You have to, there's a flight path around it. And there's, a, um, it, I knew that we are kind of going into a different situation. One, because it's Afghanistan. The work speaks for itself in the Marine Corps. They have, it carries a lot of memory within the Corps. But there, I remember the point where it hit me because there's a countermeasure box that they have uh, within the pilot suite. And with, without too many details, like they had switched on certain things. And I'm just like, and I hadn't seen those been turned on before outside of red space, red airspace. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> Okay, it just be just that little bit of a mm. gesture, and I'm like, this is different. And we did a combat landing, which means you drop in really, really quick, uh, so that way it, it's 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 harder to target that aircraft. And uh, when we landed, the guy, we didn't know what to expect. Um, like, are we going to be walking into a battle? Or are we going to be walking into? Are we have to? Is this one of those mm-hmm. where we have to shoot our way out? And so the guys already had, as we say, one in the chamber, which means you have a bullet ready to go and safety's off. So like they're ready to come shooting right out. and. The, as soon as that was happening, because uh, with the C seventeen, the ramps in the back, like you could you could tell that where their mindset was, because I felt one by one these different hands on my shoulder, and they're like pulling me behind them, like you know, chaps, just make sure you stay behind me. Mm-hmm. They're glad I was there, but they're also thinking like, okay, whatever's about to happen, like you stand behind us. Mm-hmm. Ramp went down. There's a staff sergeant there, <laughs> way too happy. Of like, welcome to Afghanistan. And I'm like, okay, I think they've secured the airfield. <laughs> like, it was like a greeting party. But stepping out, we had our full packs. They're going to take us to where we were going to be situated. Some of us were going to live in the cafeteria. Some of us, they took over the gym. The Marines would live in the gym. Um, but it's like sleep where you can. And so they, that's where they could store some of their gear. And you're just hearing shots all the time. Warning shots, right? You're not even sure what they are. And uh, like, or we're not even talking like, any kind of reprieve, like every 30 seconds, every minute, you're hearing a different burst of fire. And you just kind of, it's weird. You get used to it. And there's a little bit of chaos in the beginning just because we're trying to figure out like, how the heck do we start to sort this situation? And everybody's there from NATO. Uh, so you had Aussies, you had New Zealander, the Kiwis were there, Canadians, the Japanese were there. We, I didn't know why they were there. They didn't know why they were there. Um, we had... Uh, Azerbaijan, uh, the Turks, Italians, Spanish, uh, Brits, um, it just people from all over. It was basically NATO was represented trying to get their people out. And we were tasked with Abbey Gate, which was uh, the more southern gate of the airport. Different gates like North Gate and such. Our battalion was specifically looking after Abbey Gate. Um, and the whole idea was find green card holders, find passports, and get them out of Afghanistan. Or people who had aided us in the past, and or, and so we're working with the mm-hmm. Department of State, trying to like, okay, what are what are the groups you want us to identify? Um, and our guys, they're not they're not cultural intel experts. They're not uh, like they don't know how to look at like a European visa, like a Schengen visa, and know what that is. Uh, and so you you try to help out where you can, and so there was no time to do mass with them. Uh, so I I would say mass. Uh, back in like this abandoned contractor room uh, that we had found. And so I used that 
confected the Eucharist and I would bring the Eucharist to my guys mm -hmm. uh, for the Catholics. And then you pull people aside when they're getting shook up because they're working with kids and families and women are screaming, the kids are crying and um, they're seeing things that they're not used to. Like you're talking 18, 19, 20 year olds that have never been outside the United States. And now you have them in front of people that are desperate, uh, that are worried that their families and they're speaking Pashtun and Urdu and Uzbek and, um, and excuse me, Uzbek's not, that's Arabic, but it's a dialect. Um, and, and there's a lot of Russian speakers in the crowd too. And it, it's just a very chaotic scene. It's the, it's the most chaos I've ever seen mm -hmm. in any situation. Uh, and so you, you're reassuring them through that. Mm -hmm. At the same point, you're trying to help them where you can of like, okay, I have some knowledge of languages. Like this person actually has a working visa for, um, okay, that's Australian. It was funny because really, I thought I saw Australian camo. So I'm like, Australia. Australia and they turn around like I'm New Zealand mate and I'm like oh I'm really sorry he's like it's okay Canada and I'm like, like oh, come on like, I respected him for that I'm like and it's like you give them those little bits of humor because our guys at Abbey Gate were getting worn down because sometimes they would initially pass the smell check and they'd mm -hmm. be escorting a family in mm -hmm. and then to come to find out that they didn't have proper documentation or it was um, it was falsified or there's all these different factors mm. and then they would have to, and this is what we would call a moral wound. They had to lead those people back out the gate. And those people knew that they weren't coming back, mm. that you're not going to be like, because we had a series of gates at Abbey Gate and our more senior enlisted. So we're talking around the corporals and sergeant level saw that was weighing on the guys. And so they took over and stopped them from doing that escort out duty because people would become uh, very emotional. Mm -hmm. And but that's that's their mission. They had they had to do that, and there was times when the crowd would swell, and we would mm -hmm. we would have to use non lethals, uh, so tear gas, stun grenades, that sort of thing, to force people back. Because if they overran the airfield again, it's going to stop all those planes from going. Mm -hmm. uh, like even though people were desperate to get on a plane when they overran it the first time, like they stopped a number of our aircraft from leaving that could have brought out hundreds and thousands. But they don't know that they're panicked, and so you can't can't hold it against them. How did you? Um, so if you're <laughs> It, if you're called to care for men who are in this experience that, um, for the first time and they're seeing yeah. things they've never seen and, and, and a chaos that they've never experienced before, it was your first time of experiencing that as well, right? Yeah. It's like sometimes as a, as a father, as a, a, you're, you're put into an environment where you, you, you're, it's, easy, it's easier to care for people when you're doing it out of experience. I've been here before. Mm -hmm. I've been here multiple times. I know mm -hmm. how to care for you through this because, but you were, you were almost in the same shoes as them and yet called to care for them. How, how do you do that spiritually um, mm. in that position? Uh, I think the training we had before was key so that they knew me, that I just wasn't a foreign face. Like I didn't wear... Because at some point, we're eight feet away from Taliban with RPGs and M4s and all different kinds of weapon systems. I'm like, I probably shouldn't look like a priest. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, like, I had removed any insignia. And my, even my flak armor, even though I don't bear a weapon, we purposely designed to look like the other Marines. But my guys knew me. Mm -hmm. And there was, that, there was already that bond there. Because when you're assigned to the Marines, you go into the field with them, you train with them, you work out with them. You, as we say, embrace the suck with them. And that means a lot to them and they can see you're genuine. And that's not the time to give them theological explanations. So there's almost like a spiritual triage that needs to happen. Because if I try to unpack the mystery of good and evil in front of you in like a semi combative situation in Afghanistan, like that's, <laughs> it's not the time we probably should reschedule. Yeah. Um, but you, you suffer with them for a bit and there is, when you bring a communal nature to that suffering, because evil likes suffering to happen in isolation. And I think this might be important for our listeners to hear that sometimes the answer to suffering doesn't need to be given, but it needs to be connected. Mm. And I think that's why our Lord's arms are outstretched on the cross. One of the reasons I remember, uh, it was a first sergeant and he was leading a family out so that the younger guys didn't have to. One of the little girls took his hand and I saw how that affected him. Cause I know he had a daughter around that same age and he just, you saw the face kind of go and he, he had to do it. He had to lead them outside the gate. Um, but it, it weighed on him. It weighed on him. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that I found as I was praying about it, 
one of the things that I received is they need, they need points of hope. They need points of hope. They saved a lot of people. Um, like they even, I remember one of the HESCO barriers, big concrete barriers to stop, uh, explosives or shrapnel from moving into other areas, like these, these big walls that they can just put down by cranes. And they kept a tally mark of lives saved, of how many went through the final gate. And they're just check marks, thousands of check marks on it and like stuff like that. And so talking to our command staff there, we also agreed to start switching the units of who was where and had what mission. Like they also need to work the airfield. They need to see people get on planes. They need to see people smiling. They need to see those planes take off, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And know that they're going to another country because they need to then... And what I would do is I would collect stories of good things that people were doing. And then I would go around in those moments that they're arresting and, and you would give them those stories. Share the good news. Exactly. Because you need to, uh, evil sticky. Suffering is sticky. It, it mm-hmm. takes over the mind. It sits in the front of it. And so you need to be able to gently begin to push that aside. Not that, not that it's forgotten or we're not doing our responsibility mm-hmm. uh, to deal with it. Yeah. But like, hey, this isn't the full picture. Mm-hmm. Evil likes to make itself the full picture. It's not, it's horribly overdramatic. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, so I call those like the little witnesses to hope, yeah. uh, not to steal it from John Paul II. But that's just, <laughs> I think you're allowed to steal from John Paul II. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll share. <laughs> <laughs> was this days? I get to heaven and he's like copyrighted. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. Like, that was trademarked. Was this days, weeks, months? It was two weeks. Okay, yeah, two, it was two weeks. weeks yeah. yeah. That we were there. Um, and another thing was like, you have to focus on the one. Mm-hmm. You, you get the one and then you move on to the next. Like I remember um, there was a woman uh, in the terminal line. So she had gotten past the gate and she was just crying frantically, which is not usually the emotion that we see there. Because the terminal line, that's a time when you can build people up and the Marines were a little more relaxed because that was in a, kind of in a kind of green zone. The north side of the airport was, very, was more secure. Um, we managed to find some candy. So I was, I was going to give it to the Marines. I'm like, you know what? Give it to the Marines to give to the kids. And that was, that was another witness to hope that was big for them. Um, but she was, so this, this stood out as I was making my, so every day I would just make my rounds to all the different positions multiple times to check on them and got a translator who was there. And we're working out that somehow the family member that had her child didn't make it through the gate or wasn't at the gate that he was supposed to be. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out the situation of where this kid is. And it's, uh, this is not unheard of at Kabul at the time of like, there's this person, they're here, they're supposed to be there. They got held up by the Taliban. We don't know where they are. Like that was just, that was every day, every hour, mm-hmm. something like this was going on. This one just happened to land right in front of me. And I'm with my RP. That's Navy for bodyguard. Uh, he's, he's like my, administrative assistant and also like tactical presence. So think of like a really aggressive secretary. So it's it's like a Catholic parish. Um, That's right. And we go to Northgate. We don't have a presence at Northgate, my battalion. So I don't know really anybody there. And we take the translator because we're like, all right, we're going to try to get this kid. Because they said like, hey, he's right there. He's at Northgate. He has the Mm -hmm. kid. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, I hope you're not doing me dirty. And we're going to take a chance. And there was like a side, like Sally port to Northgate. And there's just a crowd there. The Germans were there. 82nd Airborne, I think had, uh, so that's an army group, had Northgate at that point. And a lot of the Afghan rebels who had still, uh, that were still actively fighting were there as well. <laughs> those guys were salty. <laughs> like, I think I'd seen experiences like those guys. Yeah, that was, that's a whole different story. Mm-hmm. But we, we went out, some of them, we were able to communicate what was happening. Some of them agreed to be with us for that. And, um, we went out through the Sally port, the crowd saw what we were doing, rushed the gate. They were holding them back, um, like swinging batons, saw the child. RP and I went up to the crowd, were able to grip, grab the child. And then like that, that pocket was collapsing. So we just, I was like, all these people need saved, but in the one, like that's the one I need to get. And Mm -hmm. it's all the one that I could get. And you, you get the one. Mm -hmm. And then we went back in and gave it to the family. And there's that reunion. Um, and all those people were still left outside the gate, but you, you get the one. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another story too. A, a captain, weapons company captain, Rodriguez, uh, just Raj. Uh, and he comes up to me and he had two kids at one of the, at the holding stations at the front where they would do checks. And the kids' parents had been killed by the Taliban. And since they didn't have documentation, I mean, why would they? The parents would have it. Yep. They weren't able to be able to come through the gate. 
and he just had a, he was about to have a kid himself. So fatherhood was very close and near to mm-hmm. him, an identity he was taking on. Cause all of a sudden a kid's born, boom, your father, like, mm-hmm. no, you're in a state of becoming through mm-hmm. that whole process of pregnancy that you are father and you are becoming father. Um, and he's just like, Hey, Dan, I'm like, yeah, what's up, Raj? And he's just like, I, I can't send him back. I'm like, all right, what do we do? And he's like, how many languages can you speak? I'm like, I don't even speak English that well, man. Like, he's like, I need you to speak French, German, Italian. And like, I saw what he was doing. We needed to go to allies. We need to go to NATO. And, um, and he, he was, uh, he has Cuban descent. So he's speaking Spanish to the, the Spanish commandos that were there. And the French were working on it. The Italian cabinieri were trying to help us out, but there was a lot of red tape there. Come to find out a little later when the crowd swelled, a civilian looked like a contractor because they, like the media, they wear the black uh, flak and Kevlar armor. There's one of those guys and he pulled him out from being trampled. And so basically saved this guy, turned out to be the Finnish ambassador. Mm. And he's like, hey, if there's anything that I can help you with, <laughs> like, by the way, yeah, there is. Immediately <laughs> jumps on that opportunity, which was a godsend. Wow. The Finns were very close in relations to the Swedes just b- because of their culture and also where they're located and their affinity for fish. Uh, like, <laughs> no, they were like, they offered us this Not candy. Not the candy guy. Yeah, no, they, the they, candy no guy. they did offer us oh, the candy yeah. that was fish flavored. It was absolutely disgusting. Uh, I know it was like in their mark of hospitality because we went back to where they were staged and they offered us this candy. Like, and, and, and like Raj had it in his mouth and he was just like, don't do it. And I'm like, what? And I should have listened. But I'm like, this is terrible. So it wasn't red and chewy, sweetest fish. It was a different kind. No, it was purgatory in a pill. <laughs> <laughs> like, but anyway... <laughs> yeah, I'd never want to get red pilled again. That's what it was. But yeah, I don't know what it is, but yeah. I never want to find out. But they took the kids for us, and we had uh, we had taken a picture of like, there, and one of the, the boy was scared. He was completely catatonic, was not speaking, and the sister knew some English, and she was speaking. Um, just I couldn't imagine what they went through, mm-hmm. but it probably stopped him from being made a child soldier and her a bride to mm-hmm. somebody, uh, to one of the Taliban. But um, we brought, and so I took my took my Kevlar and I put it on him. And you could tell like that meant protection to him. Mm-hmm. And we walked them out and we, we got them in a vehicle, like an up armored SUV. And we drove them to the North side, did the handoff with the Finns and they brought them to the Swedes and those that's, kids, the kids awesome. got out of there and like, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. What's the next one? And what so does my, that, what does that teach you about the heart of God or the heart of compassion when you're in moments like that? Um, of how much he bleeds for us. Mm-hmm how much he bleeds for us of, because I can only care in a limited capacity. The human art is only so wide mm-hmm. uh, and it stretches because as, as much as we know the Lord, but he's, he's the litmus test. He is the limit mm-hmm. and to see, well, lack thereof. He's the lack the of the limit. Yeah. yeah he yeah, sets yeah. the bar of that. Yeah. yeah. Of like, if I'm only able to a- like apprehend and comprehend the situation in my own limited capacity of what I am seeing, Mm-hmm. Like how much more mm-hmm. of the cross of Christ is, is mm-hmm. linked to this and how his heart bleeds for us. What did you see in the, in the, the guys? Like, so, I mean, you, you mentioned there, it's an 18, 19, 20 year olds. This is so hard to fathom. Yeah, that's the majority of them. Yeah. And you know, the, it's not like these are like probably not men with great, like pious relationships with God. And, and yet their, their natural disposition is to care for the other, to be yeah. a very self-sacrificial gift yeah. of self. Yeah. And it's like they, they enter into a Christ-like figure position, even though they may not have a deep relationship with God. What is it about the, the scenario that pulls, if you will, mm-hmm. our innate mm-hmm. Jesus out of us? I think it's written on the human heart to be so. Humans are innately good. Mm -hmm. I think what weighed on them is when they express good and then people like in the frantic situation that it was like, I'm trying to help you. And then, you know, there's a different energy coming. Uh, Differences in culture didn't help that. But I think to the root of that question is that we're innately good and we want the world to be right. And that no one joins the Marine Corps being like, I want to mess up some international relations. Like if you're, we're going to get you out pretty quick. Like this is probably not the club for you. Uh, but no, we're there to protect and there's something that we value and we put a uniform on for that. And we're willing to go across to another country and leave our family behind. And so it's, it's our, these guys were sitting around the Middle East ready to do something good for someone. Mm -hmm. And when Afghanistan kicked off the evacuations, uh, that all of that activated. And also there was a pretty clear mentality shift I sensed to my guys because they're coming in ready to fight. That's a particular switch the Marines have. And then when they turn it on, like it's on, mm-hmm. uh, like to be able to see 
when my men move into that mindset. They had pulled back from that mindset, which is probably why the attack in Afghanistan, when that occurred, why it was so impactful, because they had switched from a combative mindset to humanitarian, that I don't want to hurt these people, that I'm not here to wage war, that we are right now, we are people of peace and we're trying to bring people to safety. Like they're the, even to the fact of like our weaponry that we had to use to defend the airport was non-lethal. Yeah. Um, that it had to be, cause it's like, we are, we're not here to assert any kind of agenda. We're trying to we're help here people to bring get people out of here. Safety. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that might be in danger otherwise. So there was that mentality shift, uh, that occurred. And I think that brought out all the more their desire to mm-hmm. help and, uh, to, and even though they might not, some recognized it within their faith, I would argue that all Marines are very, very spiritual creatures, though they don't have the vocabulary to express yeah. that. Or some might even deny when I tell them that. Mm-hmm. Also, because they like to argue with me. <laughs> uh, no, it's fun. You mean masculine men like arguing? I couldn't imagine. <laughs> Is it like high protein diet men that have weapons yeah, yeah. like high banter? High level men. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I do think there's there's something there in the in the um, realm of sacrifice, though. I, yeah. I think we we've talked a lot about Western culture on this podcast and kind of what we're seeing in the church in America today. That's why the Marines love priests. What do you mean? But, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 do it, do it. Oh, I didn't want that to be a tangent. I'll I'll come back. Now that I've taken over the mic again. No, 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 I'll come back. um, It's that they recognize the sacrifice. I I believe It's like in regards to how priests live, uh, like one of the guys that I really attached to, going back to the St. Monologues, um, Though he wasn't a saint monologue, like the saint <laughs> I attached to for his story, Vincent Capadano, who's right now up for sainthood, servant mm-hmm. of God. Uh, yeah. He might be your first Medal of Honor saint, mm. uh, but mm. serving with the Marines and his story of how they attached to him just by how he lived his identity as a priest. And yeah. then things within my own experience with the Marine Corps, I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, I yeah. totally relate to that. Yeah, when we get back to but that, to well, point, it will establish the foundation is what I was saying. Because you were mentioning that they, they're fundamentally spiritual uh, people or however you just said that with like the Marines, it's because they've taken that step of sacrifice. It's that's Mm -hmm. the foundation to everything that the Lord builds on. And I think the reason that in the Western world, we're seeing such a a lapse in Christianity in faithfulness um, in general is because there's, there's no, um, there's no impetus to sacrifice. It's, it's consumeristic. It's, it's what I get is what I gain. It's a zero sum game that I'm always playing in Mm -hmm. instead of this sacrificial game whereby I help those around me to actually increase, which elevates the tide for all of the shifts. Yeah. Like sacrifice, like sacrificio, like in in that regard of making holy, like here I am, I'm expending. That was a huge, Mm -hmm. that was a huge point of theology for the guys of here I am, I'm expending my energy, my emotions, even my, the peace of my own mind Mm -hmm. to the point of exhaustion that I am now that I'm creating a space in which that family can flourish. Yeah, that's right. I can see that rather than an economic transaction, I'm going to give some of my energy, you're going to give something back. Yeah. You're not getting anything back. Well, not at that point, but you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a delayed return. Exactly. It's not an immediate yeah. gratification. But uh, the, the idea of sacrifice was so very yeah. poignant in the beginning and then obviously afterwards. Yeah, though I'll only add one more thing and I'll throw it to you. You, Dan, if you guys have anything, but like I've always loved that that quote that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Yes. Because that, that gets to this sacrifice point. It's mm-hmm. that that's act, it's, it's sacrifice that lays the foundation upon which things can be built without that. And obviously that's maximized and fully realized in Christ. And we know that. Um, and at the same time, in our participation in the body of Christ, it, it's each of our ultimate um, destinies, if we embrace it in faith, that we would sacrifice for the family that we're called to, for the parish, the church, the bride that we're called to, for the sons and daughters that we're called to. Well, what blows my mind sometimes is meeting individuals who live the sacrificial life, um, even when they don't necessarily have a, 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 a Catholic prayer life. And then you meet others who have a devout Catholic prayer life who don't live a sacrificial life. Mm, you know, it's yeah. just like that it's possible that I could actually do all the things that appear to be holy yep. and yet not actually be conformed to the image of Jesus. Whereas those like so sometimes Marines may do the things that appear to be unholy and yet are conformed to the image of yeah, a couple Jesus. of times. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's amazing <laughs> that um, ultimately the Lord, he works all things for his, for his good and for his glory. And he takes different people into different uh, um, ways of conversion to the, the goal of holiness. The goal of conversion is to become Christ. Yeah, and, right, right. And it's, it's interesting that sometimes 
the um, the pious lifestyle can actually prevent mm-hmm. me from becoming Christ. It, it, it's almost it's what happened to the Pharisees. I was just about to say that when Jesus says that they're whitewashed tombs, yeah. what is that saying? It's saying that inside the tomb, there's no longer the remnants of sacrifice. Yeah. Like in, inside you is something that is not relating to that which you're manifesting externally. Mm-hmm. That internal disposition of the the laying down that that yields the harvest of righteousness, that yields the harvest of virtue, of holiness. It, it, it the the disconnect is evident. Yeah. Right? yeah. If piety isn't attached to its natural end, which is preserving that spirit of sacrifice, then what purpose does it serve? Precisely. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking the same thing that Jesus goes after that. Uh, so, Father, how does how does the attack happen? Does it happen within within those two weeks? It does. It was happening towards the end. We were actually um, a matter of hours away of uh, transferring control of Abbeygate to the eighty second. Uh, so the army was going to take it over. Um, I was down at Abbeygate uh, that particular day, um, and I was making my rounds. And the guys had they were working; they had everything under control, and there was no real kind of break. Nobody was on a rest period, so you you don't pull guys off the line like, "Hey, how you doing?" Like you let the Marines do their job, but you can, you you can tell when people need something. Like they'll make eye contact; they see you. Uh, or they're just deliberately calling you over. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, it's that ministry of presence that you're there. And so like, cause well, they, they see you when you're around and like the, even in training, when you're at the range, like the Marines shoot better, like I'm some kind of good luck charm. Like, <laughs> are you serious? Like, Hey chaps, we gotta get the st- scores up. Do you want to come to the range today? I'm just like, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know if it works. All right, whatever, man. I'm like, <laughs> Appreciate the invitation. Yeah, there's, there's some kind of amulet. I'm like, no, it's, it's still fun. It's cool to see. So I go anyway, but, uh, it's kind of that. And so I left to go back to the North side of the airfield to work on a coming home brief. Uh, of like, hey, you've been in the Middle East. Your wife's been home with a kid. You guys have been living two very different lives. How do you come back together? Like, okay, if you're looking for a place, here's how rentals work. And so it's basically getting the guys to return back to civilization, mm-hmm. to reintegrate with family and with, because yeah, you've been gone for the better part of a year. And gee whiz, some things have changed. So you miss baby's birthday. And this, so like, mm-hmm. how do you come back to that? Mm-hmm. So my mind was in completely in another place. The guys are getting ready to be pulled off the mission on Abigate. We're packing up. We're going to go home. Um, and there was, there was a distinct pop. Uh, I didn't think anything of it. It may not even have been that because they're just gunshots and pops all over the place. It got to the point you could tell which nation was firing a weapon. I'm like, it was a little higher pitch. That sounded like a bull up. That was probably the Brits. It, like, it's weird that a priest like knows that. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't feel comfortable having that information in my head. You hear a burst. I'm like, that's a 240 Bravo. I'm like, no, it's... Like, I don't feel like I should know, but it's just, <laughs> it's just what you're around. You, we're spiritual amphibians. We absorb our environment. Uh, and then I got uh, a message on my phone. At the same time, I heard a lot of engines revving up because like near where we had that contracted building is where the, what we called a QRF, quick reaction force. The army had that mission. Uh, they had a lot of like armored up vehicles that at any point, if they needed to go to anywhere in the air, airfield, they're just on standby. I heard all those engines going like, that's different. Maybe they're moving them. Then I got a, a message uh, from a chaplain in the army, a uh, colonel. Her name is Pinky Fisher. She was great. Uh, she was very, very good. Uh, and she just said, mass cash, get to, get to medical. Um, and it's like, there, there are other things that had occurred in that. So I'm kind of moving fast and loose with the story to kind of get to that point um, uh, before uh, Abigail, but uh, ended up at medical. And there's different triaging sections uh, within medical. Uh, so you have like, you know, your, your green, yellow, red, black, uh, so that the medical staff can work to save as many people as possible. And uh, when I had got there, uh, and there's just, an, there's just an army soldier stationed every 20 feet on the road. It looked like someone had kicked the hornet's nest because now there's helos everywhere. There's just everybody now is in Flack and Kevlar. Everyone's armed. And just moving all over the place. Like this place just became a beehive of activity. Uh, like it, it went. So that transition that my Marines had done, it completely shifted for the entire base for, excuse me, for the entire airport. Now everyone's just high alert. So I'm like, okay, this is an attack. Uh, and our, our particular guys were, had a camo that we were, that would call, we would call it desert frogs. Um, and it was unique to us going there because Afghan, you would usually use um, woodland frogs. 
But since we were coming from Iraq and Kuwait and different places, we kept our deserts. Uh, and so it was really easy to see which of my, which were my guys. And when I got to medical and I saw the stretchers, because they would just cut you right out of your uniform um, just to see if they're like, you, yeah. you're just laid bare for all to see so they can work on whatever they need to. Because there's uh, polite civilization kind of goes out of the window mm-hmm. in that kind of emergency situation. And I just saw these bloody uniforms on these different stretchers and it was desert frogs, desert frogs, desert frogs, desert. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's all my guys. Um, and uh, so I then, when I, when I got to the first triaging station, there's some of the guys there on stretchers that were still in their frogs. And you know, Colonel Fisher was there and she's rushing to the next day. And she's like, father, just get to work. And that's all she said. And uh, there, was, um, there was Riley uh, McCollum and he was, and I, I knew him from Golf Company, which was, uh, that was a good experience in Jordan because when I went over for golf, uh, all the officers were busy and kind of a little bit of backstory, uh, which is important to tell. I was the only officer that like, wasn't tied down to training because I'm the chaplain. Like, why am I going to teach you how to call in artillery? Like, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was able, since we were in Jordan, to take them to different sites. So I would take them to the baptismal site mm-hmm. uh, on the Jordanian side. And we would go to the Dead Sea and they'd freak out. You see these, these Marines become little kids like, I can't sink. And they put their head under them and they're like, come out burning. They're screaming. I'm like, what did we learn? And, all that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I told them like, hey, the water here is like an acid. And mm-hmm. like that, that word has new meaning for them. And <laughs> like, I bring water down. So like, I, I, I know what's going to happen. Like you see one Marine does it. Another one's going to be an idiot and do it. And it's like, all right. <laughs> I mean, they're awesome guys, but yeah. Uh, and we like, I would, we would get dinner. Uh, excuse me, lunch. And I'm like, Hey, you want American or you want Jordanian? And they pick mm-hmm. different things. And we, we take, I was, I, now I've probably been to the river Jordan more times because we can only take smaller groups because the Jordanians didn't want a bunch of Marines all at once rolling around their country, which I could understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we would take these groups uh, to the Jordan river. And I probably did that for six days on end. So I just saw the Jordan river for like mm-hmm. six or seven different times. I'm mm-hmm. like, all right, well, <sighs> kind of rack that up <laughs> it's Check. a bragging point but you would see them because they, yeah they do wear a bit of bravado there's a mask there, like oh we're marines okay we're not, we're not emotional or spiritual people but come on we all are mm-hmm. and you that mask and no matter what i would preach or with my own skill or personality like it doesn't like nothing can compare to like how the holy land preaches just by itself the mm-hmm. land preaches like you were here he was here um, and mm-hmm. that even the guys who just came for like a historical perspective for our listeners, I'm doing air quotes on historical <laughs> perspective. Um, like you see, it affects them. And you saw that you saw their souls come forward. You saw their prayer come forward. You saw mm-hmm. how their rays come forward and you saw them come alive and, uh, the good and the bad. And it was just a very redeeming experience for many of them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I remember McCollum cause he, we were coming back and he was at a gas station. And I guess the guy went for change and like, he didn't understand culture, like what was happening. So he just walked out with his drink and all these people are coming out screaming Arabic. And he was just like, I didn't know I had to pay. I'm like, what gas station in the world do you not, not have, have to, to pay, pay for, for a drink? drink. <laughs> and so I'm just like, geez, right. I'm like, oh, I'm uh, And so I'm like, I'm working, th- I'm working through some, uh, like I'm, I'm speaking Arabic to these guys. I paid them a little extra money. I'm like, Hey, sorry for your problem. Like we're fine. They're, we're all good. Like, you know, they're, we're, we're thrown around Habibi by the end, which is like an endearing term. It's hilarious to them. And so like, we're fine. We leave. And I'm just like, McCollum, you're sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> no more gas stations for you. <laughs> so you weren't just a spiritual father. You were just also the no, dad. You're literally dad yeah. to these guys. So like father, that term has a lot of extension. I mean, cause they're still young guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just like, cool. You can like hit a mark from like, I don't even know, like 300 feet out, but I'm just like, you forget how basic economics were. <laughs> um, uh, but he just had a kid two weeks prior and I go up, I'm like, Hey Riley, I'm here. And, uh, I'm, my, my, my flak armor, uh, the very front pocket is my anointing kit. I just keep it right there. Um, and I'm opening up and I touch his arm and, um, I had worked in a hospice and just with seminary and the priesthood and ICU before. And as soon as I touched his arm, like you can just kind of sense it like, Oh, he's dead. Uh, he's already died. Uh, and I'm like, and then I saw where I was, I was in the black area for the triage. These were those that are either expecting or already died. Um, and that just kind of like hit me in that moment. I'm like, mm. my, my guys are already dying. This isn't just wounded. Like we're, we're losing people. Um, so, you know, when in doubt, like I didn't know at the point when he died, like the, the church is, uh, very generous in its sacraments of mercy. Like, Hey, when in doubt anoint. So 
anointed him, anointed the others. Um, so at that point, they didn't have their dog tags on. Some some of the bodies, like we couldn't recognize uh, at that point. It's like, who is this? And I, at now, Marines are allowed to do full sleeve tattoos. But before I saw the full sleeves, and because I'd known my guys and I talked to them before, I saw how they're arranged. Uh, it, it got weird that I got to help them. I can't stop them from getting tattoos. But one guy was just like, hey, I was thinking about, you know, something manly for flowers, like roses. I'm like, well, look up St. Joseph. You're already going to see his lilies. Next thing I know, he's got lilies all over his arm. <laughs> I'm just like, so there, oh, there's all these Marines from my generation of like walking around with Catholic tattoos. <laughs> right, not even Catholic, just because they're like, yeah, Chaps, he's like, he does do good sketches. Go to him. I'm like, <laughs> you do like, do good sketches. It was, it, was really, it was a really weird ministry of like, of helping Sketching like, up lilies. of like redirect the Marines tattoos. Yeah. But I saw, um, I saw this particular sleeve and I knew it was, it was Soviak, one of the corpsmen. And uh, so you're also helping identify the dead. And once I had kind of helped with that, I moved on into uh, the actual shock trauma unit itself. And yeah, it's surreal. There's, uh, there, there's just, there was uh, blood and viscera all over the floor and you could tell it was being moved back and forth. And cause there was the, 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 the tire tracks through it from, uh, from the different gurneys. And you know, there's just doctors everywhere and they're doing the best they can because it's NATO. And so you're hearing English and Finnish and Swedish and um, <laughs> British, which is another language besides English. Uh, and they're, they're communicating. It was amazing how they can just use medical terms and they know what the other is requesting. And so it was really cool to see how professional they were in working, uh, but obviously not focusing on that. And found some of my other guys uh, that were, pretty badly banged up, anoint them. You just try to get access to any point of skin. Uh, found our opso who took, who took shrapnel into his arm and into his ankle. Um, and one, a corporal came up to me and just like, and I recognized him and I'm just kind of, I called his name and he turns around and he looks at me and just chaps. I'm like, Oh no, they gave him morphine. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, Hey buddy. He's like, yeah, I just need a chaplain. I'm like, no, you need a chair. <laughs> um, I'm sad. I'm like, you're fine. Just hang out. And he'd taken one through, through the shoulder. Um, and some guys were also very lucky. Uh, one guy had it through the neck and it missed all of his vertebrae. It came out the other side through his cheek. Another guy took one right through the face, uh, missed everything vital, but it was miraculously just kind of stopped there. And, and you're not thinking about that. You're just making sure that they're okay. Um, and the army assistant to the chaplain. So she'd worked with Pinky Fisher. She came over like, Hey, we have a Catholic who's passing, uh, pulled his tags. Like, can you anoint him? Like, yeah, of course. Uh, so I went over and it was, it was one of my guys from golf. It was Hunter, uh, Hunter Lopez. He wanted to be a sheriff in Orange County. And, uh, and I remember when I was getting ready for a trip, he asked me like, chaps, you want, because he was big on chess. Yeah. And he asked me, do you want to play a game? And I'm like, Hey, I'm getting this trip ready, man. Like, Hey, remind me later. And like, should have played that game. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause I didn't. And, um, so I anointed him. And this whole time, mind you, like my brain's racing. Like there's no, we don't take a class on this in seminary, <laughs> what to do in like a war zone. And, um, in my whole time, like anytime I hit like a wall of like, what do I do? I'm like, what would a priest do? What would a priest do? What would a priest do? And that's mm -hmm. like, so I wasn't pulling from myself. Like you pull from that identity that Christ gave you. And I'm like, yeah. I, there was nobody there from two, one, there's nobody there from our battalion. And I knew Hunter was a Catholic and I'm like, and so part of me is being drawn into that project of just like, find the next person. I'm like, no, stay with him. And so I anointed him. Um, I told him that I was there and I held him until he died, until he passed so that mm -hmm. he would die with uh, someone from our battalion, but also a priest. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes again, you don't have to have the right answer because evil doesn't have an answer. Uh, that's one of the things I realized it's, because mm -hmm. as soon as it does, like that means it fits the equation mm -hmm. and it doesn't, it's irrational. It shouldn't exist. So there's always part of it that's unknowable because it, it's a parasite. Mm -hmm. That's like saying like the ta a tapeworm belongs in the body. You're like, no, that doesn't even make sense. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's the same thing. And so, but we're not called to always have the answer, but sometimes you're just called as Christ does to suffer with through evil. Cause that's what he does. He takes it upon himself. He absorbs it and then transforms it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that was that was a poignant moment as well, yeah. uh, and there, there was other things that occurred. That was a long night. Um, one at one point, the refrigerator broke, and these army guys, obviously who hadn't been through anything too significant, just 
look like they were right out of high school um, because Army handles mortuary affairs. And they had these big trailers that were refrigerated for the bodies. One of them broke. And they're like, what do we do? I'm like, we'll move them into another refrigerated trailer. And you can tell how uncomfortable they are. I'm like, RP, let's go. And so we moved all of our guys. So as, as their priest picking up each of their bodies and, and moving them too. Um, and then because the dog tags were cut off along with the uniforms to help identify them. And so I'd have to, to help them out and unzip and, and, to, see, and to see each. Uh, there's some that I didn't know. Uh, there's, a, there's an army guy, um, Nos who was killed. I had seen him around, but I didn't know who he was. And then two other Marines from a different battalion, uh, two females uh, that had passed, but the other 10, those were our guys uh, of the 13 killed. Um, then we had a ramp ceremony in which uh, the, you know, the, the coffins are all brought onto the plane. And, um, and I mean, you won't see anything like that outside of another world war because every country there was lined up for mm-hmm. our guys. It was really powerful. Um, Brits, the French, the Italians, the Germans, they're just all lined up. So that idea of sacrifice literally brought all these nations together uh, in, in a line and they're all gathered around those. And so to watch my, to watch my boys, like to bring their brothers onto the plane. And it's a very formal thing. Like, you know, they're marching and all that, trying to keep pace as best they can. And they're in their full armor and kit. And once they get on the plane, the chaplain has a prayer and they're just kind of standing there awkwardly. Cause like, they're, they're military members. like if they're in that formal mindset so i'm like guys it's okay kneel down i'm giving you as much time as you need take your 30 seconds take your minute mm-hmm. like it's okay you can pray right now say your goodbyes and you just saw them like just release all of that emotion and tears would flow and we did that 13 more times with each of them and yeah. uh, so that ministry too like giving people permission to be human is okay mm-hmm. and that was a big thing yeah um, yeah. And so like following on that, like I, remaining in the middle East, uh, I talked to the commanding officer and cause we were in a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a bind. Like, do I go back with golf company? Uh, cause that's the one that took the most casualties mm-hmm. or do I stay around with the guys? And he made a very good point. Like there'll be chaplains and psychologists and their families there. So there's more resiliency points within the States because golf was being sent back first. He's like, I would really like you to stay here. And I was like, good. Cause I'm like, sir, I'm torn. I just need you. I need you to give me an order. Mm-hmm. I guess I can't figure this out. And he's just like, happily, like you're, saying, <laughs> <laughs> like you're staying. Um, it was and, nice. Did I, did, 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 I, did I pitch it away? I'm like, Bishop, I think this is your decision. Like I totally did that to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, he, he, he knew it too. Uh, and like to, to work with him and some of the other officers too, because like those guys are under their care. There's a spirit of stewardship there, religious or not. And you see it weighs on them. It really mm-hmm. weighs on them. Um, and then the different ceremonies at this camp and at this base um, to remember it, cause just because of all the media attention that occurred. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was a lot. I'll pa- kind of pause there. It's a long narrative. No, that's great. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's hard to even know what to say to it. <laughs> I was, um, you don't need to. It's all right. Yeah, but right. we're on a show. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, no, but that's kind of what these things exist to do is to say something, you know? Well, I think the... <laughs> Gee, um, look at this microphone. <laughs> that, you know, Paul says, when I am weak, I am strong and that his yeah. grace is sufficient. Um, the, the, as you said, the seminary does not prepare you for an experience like that. The, I don't even I'm, know how you I'm would sure, write a class for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure the, uh, whatever preparation you got into military chaplaincy didn't prepare you for it either. So really in those moments, it's, it is simply grace, right? You have to, we, we sometimes find ourselves in situations, in um, experiences that there is no, there is no preparation that could have gotten us ready for that. It's his mm-hmm. grace is sufficient. What was the, well, how old were you when, when, when you were in Afghanistan? Let's see. That was the three years ago or two years ago. Sorry. Time is a strange thing to me now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would have been 31, Okay, 32. so, I mean, to to some extent, too, like, even, like, they're kids, but to, like, you're still a kid, too, right? Like, they're still, like, mature, like, yeah. this is something that, and so, what mm-hmm. was what was the grace that you experienced the Father pouring out onto you in that season, and then since that season? Uh, so during that season, then after, sort yeah. of thing? Yeah, during that season was probably tranquility. Like, some kind of Asian fighting movie where you see the guy who's just like completely emotional. No, not that at all, but there's a, to be able to move through that situation and beyond my own ability to still be 
uh, peaceful. Yeah. Uh, cause one, I recognize that the guys need that. They take an emotional cue from you. Um, even cause we had, we had suspected that, uh, we had gotten Intel that there was going to be an attempt from different groups to probably attack us. Uh, that, that was, that was common knowledge. Um, but the guys, like when I went into certain areas, they're like, no, no chaps, you're not, you're not going to go there. Um, and so they were, they were very keen on protecting what they saw as a source of support and peace. Uh, for that, they're just like, yeah, the chaplain can't get hit. And mm -hmm. so, and it, part of me was just like, all right, young, and I know I'm like one person <laughs> aside, but you need to, you need to let them do that. You need to let mm -hmm. them do that. Um, I think the grace after the fact, it, it became pretty chaotic for the guys because of one, the media attention and they're flooded with counselors and psychologists and other chaplains and nothing against because those are all wonderful professionals and sources of support. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, just, let them go home, put them on a fishing trip. Um, I always kind of go back to the model of uh, World War II, why a lot of the guys, like back then, battle fatigue or shell shock or whatever you want to call it. I know PTSD is, is kind of a big name, as it, as it should be. It's, it's we're understanding more of the effects of battle on people, but they didn't have that. Because when you're coming back from World War II, you're on a ship with all those guys for, what, three, four, or five weeks. And that, that's a community of support uh, and of integration and of discovery. And now they're on a plane and they're back home within a day, day and a half. Uh, and all of a sudden you are around people that don't know how to ask you these questions. They don't know how to understand what you're saying. They, uh, they mean well. And mm -hmm. so there's this, there's this, um, there's not this exchange that's occurring. That's, that's kind of essential for that, for that human integration. Uh, so I think another grace there was to be able to connect them. Uh, yeah. to build communities. So the grace afterwards was community to get them mm. to be able to, so I would, uh, they're, they're kind of like fake trainings um, that we would set up. It was basically for the guys just to be around and talk with each other, just like hang out. Mm -hmm. And they don't even to see anything, just to be like around each other. Um, so that way they could, they could process. And I think that was, I think that was a very successful thing that we did. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would say peace and then community, the before and after. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Blessed be God. I, uh, I'm just struck, Father, you shared the, that, that word that um, the question you asked yourself is what would a priest do? And obviously most of our audience are not priests, but, but I think pulling back to that fundamental identity, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that identity is something that oftentimes we claim is like, that this is a fruit of my own decision-making or this is a fruit of yeah. the, you know, my personality. And at a, at a certain fundamental level, identity is something that's, that's a gift. Oh, it is. It absolutely is. And, and the, the point I would make with the guys is like, hey, you have a name, a DNA, a family yeah. that you didn't choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, for, and for the Christian and for the Catholic, I mean, we, we speak about the grace of our baptismal identity all the time. And, and like when, when all else fails and when I don't have enough strength to, to, pull on my own will and make a decision that's impossible in a moment to be able to, to reflect and even ask that question like, okay, what, what does a Christian do right now? Mm -hmm. Or what does, what does a priest or prophet or king do right now? Yeah. That's the stabilizing point. And, and that, like, that question is, is sufficient to call upon something that's deeper than my personality or my weakness or my, or my virtue in a particular moment, but actually something fundamental to, to that stability, that anchor mm -hmm. that God created in me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I think you made it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, I know. Like, Which no, is why I'm a fan. <laughs> no, it's, it's, that, that broadens it into, I, I think, into the correct and healthy like, perspective. Yep. Um, obviously, mine being fo <laughs> like, focused through voca the lens sure, of vocation. Sure. Yeah. So, Father, what is the, I guess, as, as you've had this, um, as you've been going through this, this time with the, with your, uh, with those that you're called to serve, what, what, how does that translate into everyone else's service? Does that make sense? Like when you think about oh, you your experiences, again. yeah, your experiences, how does it translate into my experience in my everyday life or oh, our question. listeners experience in their everyday life? How can we, how can we learn from your testimony to, to enter into our own mission here in the United States? I think 
Oh, the easy one would be like, I don't know. That's your job. No, I'm like, no, it's a, for the listener. I'm like, oh, what do you think? Yeah. I know that's a cop out. Um, and I've thought on it a lot. Uh, I think first and foremost to know how active the heart of Christ is in the trenches. Um, of that these dark places in the world are not just tucked away from the eyes of whatever media we follow, but, and so like out of sight, out of mind, like know that he's, he's active there. He's working there. His grace is there that our Lord is powerful and present and moving among us. He's not just a God that we meditate on then like, Oh, okay. I'm kind of lining some things up, but he's, no, this is a God who walks among us, Mm -hmm. right? The Mm -hmm. the God who became as a man to walk among humanity. And that still exists, that uh, nature is assumed and it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing that I would say too is just on, and this this might be a little bit of a deeper, harder note to make of the importance or rather the call of suffering within the spiritual life. Because as we are called into the mission of the church and to take on Christ's mission, there is a time that we are able to redeem others, to help others by becoming Christ-like to them by suffering with them, by willingly entering into a situation that is no advantage to ourselves, taking upon that pain, and then them being better for it. Mm-hmm. I think that's very key. Um, and that sounds like big, high, pie in the sky theology, but it's not. Like you see that in families, mm-hmm. you see that in friendships, that it's almost second nature to certain people. Like this person's having a hard time. Of course, I would reach out to them. Mm-hmm. Or why wouldn't I? And so, mm-hmm. in a way, it's just an activation of what spiritually is already written on our DNA. It's just letting grace permeate where it, where it desires to, yeah. where it naturally finds a home. It's funny. I was, uh, I was praying the other day and, um, I can't remember what worship song it is, but there's something about there's like, there's no holding back or I'm mm-hmm. not holding back. And, um, and the, the Lord was, it was just like, Dan, so often you hold back on love just because you feel like you don't know what to do. <laughs> you know? And I think it's like, uh, and it's like, why do you hold back? Like, uh, I'm at, I'm asking you not to hold back on love and you're mm-hmm. not holding like you're holding back on love because you can't remember that person's name. So you're not going to love them because you can't remember their name. That's yeah. such a stupid reason. Maybe not just to love. ask them again what their name is and yeah. then love them there. Or, yeah. or, or yeah, like, Oh, oh I'm not going to call that person who's suffering because oh, maybe they don't, they, 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 I'm sure they've got enough they're going through. So you're holding back on love for all these silly reasons. And mm-hmm. the Lord just wants us not to hold back, right. Yeah. To, to love his people with a reckless, full, complete, irrevocable self gift. And, yeah. um, because there's, there's so many, like you could have easily been, oh, well, there's, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to move into this situation. I just got to let the doctors yeah. do their job, you know? And like, like whenever there's that hesitancy to hold back on love, just press through mm-hmm. it. Yeah. I know we're coming towards close. I think I, I, um, if I can paraphrase what I'm, what I'm hearing through you father, and then what I think you added there, Dan, I, anyone listening, I think there's a, a, a twofold takeaway that we can have from what you've shared with us, father. So, um, honorably. So thanks for sharing it and, uh, and, and for your heart in it. Um, one is that even in the hardest moments of our lives, the Lord's there with us because he's the one who's always willing to accompany. And because we as Christians should step into knowing that we can then become that for those in our lives. Right. So this twofold reality where when we're aware that Jesus accompanies us, even in the most difficult seasons of life, we can then in knowing that recognize that his call for us is to accompany those alongside us yeah. in some of their most trying times in life. And that that's obviously true for a military chaplain, but that's true for every lay person. That's true for Aaron, Dan, myself, and, and everyone listening. So, um, thanks for who you are, honestly. And, um, and for, uh, just for your witness. I'm so grateful for it personally. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Aaron, any last thoughts? Uh, just love and live in life with you, man. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm excited that you're here. Uh, it does me good to see you guys again. Well, yeah. <laughs> it, we, we, we spent some time together this morning, but um, it's, it's always encouraging and, and sort of hard to believe that you've got very limited time in your, in your 
free personal life and you choose to spend a week here in service to a community of us, of leaders, of friends, and also of students. Um, and it just, it speaks highly of your character. So thanks for being part of this team and part mm-hmm. of this mission, part of this family. Yeah. And in many ways, this is home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is home. Well, welcome home. And thank you for joining us on hey. Beyond <laughs> Damascus. Uh, thank you, Father Daniel Schwartz, for your incredible testimony and uh, your willingness to share and expose your heart. And um, the if this show has blessed you, please share it with others and allow uh, it to bless other people. You've been listening to Beyond Damascus, a show where encounter meets mission. Join us next time. Thank you.